God bless you. Welcome to another edition of uh, our study of the doctrines of the Bible. We call it the School of Doctrine. And we began studying the doctrine of salvation. We emphasized the necessity for salvation, not just as a means of escaping the messianic judgment, nor a bet into a family and a kingdom, but we also looked at it as the only channel through which the eternal purpose of God can be achieved. Salvation became necessary because there was an agenda for which man was created and the fall would not allow that man to fulfill that agenda. So there was every need for man to be restored to that state where he sustains the capacity to advance that agenda which was born in the heart of the Father before the foundations of the world. So salvation was necessary because there was a divine agenda, because there is a kingdom, because there is a relationship, and there is a purpose that God had in mind. And in our study of the subject of salvation, we stated that salvation was very important first and primarily for fulfilling that agenda that is in the heart of the Father. And secondly, we also saw that it was very significant because without it, it would be impossible for man to have a relationship with God, for man to have a, the life of God, before you can even talk about fulfilling the purpose that was in the heart of the Father. So salvation is one of the most significant agenda in the heart of God. Salvation is God's strategy of bringing the man back to that place where he mirrors everything that he had in, the, in mind before he began the project of creation. And we said that um, man was vitally operating in the class of God because he was created in the image and likeness of God. According to Genesis chapter 2 verse 26 and 28, we also all saw that man was created as a being of intimacy because the father, a being of love, wanted a creation that he could enjoy love and fellowship with. This was the fundamental motivation for creation. God wanted to have fellowship, intimacy with his creation. This is why John said that which was from the beginning, which we have heard which we have looked upon and our eyes have handled of the word of life is what we commit to you. He said the life was with the Father. We have seen him and we declare him unto you. That life which was with the Father, which we have seen and handled is what we bring to you. And the reason, John said, is that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father. So God desired fellowship. God desired intimacy. God desired oneness with his creation. That was a fundamental motivation for creation because God is a being of love and we now saw that the man who was designed to advance the agenda of God was a man of absolute intimacy in Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 the Bible said in the cool of the day the voice of God came walking in the garden in the cool of the day is Ruach Ayom Ruach Ayom that means the spirit's moment the time of the spirit so the man watched up looked out for that moment and you'd realize that when man fell he was aware of that time of fellowship so when god was coming into the garden he ran and hid himself because it's a normal routine in the garden so fellowship intimacy love is one of the motivations of creation and finally we said the top motivation for creation was for creation to be in perfect harmony with god functioning under his government what you would call dominion and i said dominion is not just be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue the earth. I said dominion is the ability in man to bring creation under the government of God. Creation working and existing under perfect harmony with God. This is why God created a prototype, Eden. Earth was supposed to become Eden, the place that mirrors the dimensions of the heavens. And that was man's assignment. So three things we looked at was the fact that man was a bearer of the image of God. Secondly, man was a being of intimacy. And thirdly, man was an agent of dominion. 
This was possible because the man walked by the economy of light. Upon the fall, the man declined from that economy. In um, Psalm 82 verse 5, he said, I have said unto you, ye are gods, because you are the children of the Most High, but you know not, neither would you understand. You walk on in darkness, and you will fall like one of the princes. So the man began to walk in darkness. But what God designed the man to live by was by the economy of light, because God dwells in light. Fellowship is only possible in light. In, and as he gazed through the crystals of God and looked, looks upon the light of God, he draws life, he draws inspiration, he draws wisdom, he draws power. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, he said, If we walk in the light as he is in the light. So man was fundamentally walking in the light, walking by the economy of light. So the agent of dominion, the being of intimacy, and the bearer of the nature and likeness of God was that which the Father saw in his heart. A form of life that the father saw in his heart and he created and encapsulated in a vessel called man but unfortunately this man that was created to be a God to contain God to express God in fulfilling God's will decided to go the way of rebellion on account of his accepting the deception of the devil and he was no longer capable of that operation and we said upon the fall man declined from operating in the realm of glory man declined from operating in the realm of the image the nature of god he said for all have seen and fallen short of the glory of god romans 3 23. we also said that upon the fall the man fell from his standing with god the man was a coronated being the man was an enthroned being in psalm 8 verse 4 he said what is man that thou art mindful of him what is the son of man that thou did visit him? He said, you made him a little lower than the Elohim. So man was a coronated creature. But on, a, on account of the fall, he declined from that height in Zion. So when God came into the garden, God could no longer pick the vibrations of man. And God would ask, he said, Adam, Genesis 3 verse 9, where art thou? You have fallen from your rank in the spirit. You have fallen from your place of authority in the spirit. You have fallen from that statutory position where you are having the power to regulate and to control the visible universe. Where are thou? God is omniscient. He knows. So the question was not location-based. The question was ranking-based. The question was, was status-based. So the man fell from the rank and the status of God. And we also saw that the moment the man fell, he became a slave of Satan. Because according to the law of the Spirit, whoever you yield yourself servant to obey, the servant of him you are, whom you have obeyed, in Romans chapter 6 verse 16. So the moment man sinned, he became the, the servant, the son, the offspring of the devil. So man had no authority anymore. On the Mount of Temptation, in Matthew chapter 4, when the devil came tempting Jesus, he said, bow down to me, I will give you all the glories of the earth, for it has been delivered unto me. Jesus never challenged the statement because upon the fall, man handed his authority to the devil. So he became the slave of the devil. We also saw that man was denatured. He was not only denatured, rather, but he took upon himself the nature of the serpent. In John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus said, You are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father shall ye do. The lust of your father. The devil operates by the economy of lust and rebellion. Man had taken that economy. He had taken that nature. The nature of God is the nature of love. Man was created with the nature of God, but this time he's been denatured and he's taken upon himself the serpentine nature. All of this is what we saw and considered to be the fall of man. Now, the only strategy by which man can fulfill that divine agenda, which is to contain God, to contact God, to contain God and to express God through his knowledge of God, through intimacy and worship and through the exercise of authority to bring dominion, was no longer in view except as redemption is activated and we said redemption is the word lustros or alupropsis and that word simply means to purchase with a ransom and we also said redemption is synonymous with the word salvation and the word salvation is the word soteria or the word sozo and that word means to deliver to save and to redeem so the protocol of salvation is actually to take man from the hold of the devil from the influence of the falling world and to bring man back into the economy of light and life that exists in god and this would be possible when the legal dimension is both at the is attained and the organic dimension is attained the legal dimension is the judgment of god at the 
different dispensations in the dealings of God and how God foreshadowed salvation and finally consummated it in Christ. We said in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1, it was revealed that the Old Testament is a type and a shadow of the New. So everything God would do in the New Testament, he foreshadowed in the Old Testament. So we saw how God foreshadowed salvation in the life of Noah, in the life of Abraham, and in the life of Israel as a nation. And then how God would ultimately bring salvation in Christ Jesus. So all of that we discussed yesterday. And we said the protocol of salvation, as we outlined yesterday, is a journey from judgment to love. It's a journey from judgment to experience. It's a journey of separation from the world and separation unto the Lord. And taking Israel, for example, we said God judged Egypt, which is a type of the world. And there, are, there were three judgments that God gave to Egypt. The first was the killing of the firstborn of Egypt and the ten plagues the killing of their firstborn son, inclusive in the ten plagues. And the second judgment was God spoiling the Egyptians by transferring the wealth of Egypt to Israel. And the third judgment, we saw that God drowned Egypt's mighty men in the Red Sea. We also saw that God judged the gods of Egypt in Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. He said, I will pass through Egypt tonight and I will judge the gods of Egypt. So God judged the world. He judged the gods of Egypt and he separated the man. The separation protocol was what happened as man crossed over the Red Sea. And we also looked at a very interesting aspect of this separation process yesterday. We saw that when God was judging the world and judging the princes of this world, he had no concern about the flesh. Because the first thing God would do is to first of all judge the powers that keeps man in bondage. And then he separates man from those powers. When God achieves that, then God begins to deal with the flesh. So you saw that we saw that in Genesis chapter 14, from verse 9 to 13, when Israel saw Egypt approaching, they began to cry to the Lord and murmured against Moses and the Lord. God did not do anything against their murmuring. Rather, God, through Moses, told them to steal and see the salvation of the Lord. Because the first protocol is to judge the world, judge the powers of this life, and to separate the sinner to the side of God. It is when the sinner is separated that God begins to deal with the flesh. So you see that in the New Testament economy, Jesus died. Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus was resurrected. All of that had no impute of man. It was purely done by God. But when that happens and man accepts Jesus and is saved, in order for man to stay safe, God begins to deal with the flesh. This morning, we want to look at how God deals with the flesh because the moment Israel crossed over the Red Sea, God would no longer tolerate the flesh. And I, 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 I picked out some very important scriptures yesterday to explain how God deals with the flesh. You notice that, like we said in the last class, that every significant entity that constituted the community of Israel was dealt with. They are, the flesh was dealt with in every one of them. I said Moses, in Exodus 7 verse 1, God made Moses a God. God also made Moses a deliverer. In Exodus chapter 3, God also made Moses the king of Israel. In Exodus chapter 33, God also made Moses. You know, the Bible said Moses is the king of Jeshurun. Jeshurun is Israel. So Moses was the king of Jeshurun. So Moses had a status of a God, a deliverer, a king. And Moses was also the leader of Israel. He formulated the government of Israel. But as mighty as Moses was, God will still not tolerate flesh. Because flesh can be allowed when God judges the world. But when the man wants to walk with God, flesh will no longer be allowed. The reason is simple. The Bible said no flesh shall glory in his presence. Because if flesh is not dealt with, flesh will destroy everything God wants to achieve. And flesh will want to take the glory that is due unto the Lord. So... Moses, as mighty as he was, was judged. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 49 to 51, God will tell Moses to go up, up to the Mount of Nebo, and there he should die. You know what God said? Amazing. He said, get thee up into this mountain, Abarim, unto Mount Nebo, which is the land of Moab, that is, over, that is against Jericho, and behold, the land of Canaan. So God allowed Moses to see the promise 
but flesh wouldn't get into the promise and he said behold the land of canaan which i give unto the children of israel for a possession and god would say and die in the mountain whither thou goest that means flesh must die flesh will not walk in the reality of the promise he said and die and in verse 51 god will tell moses the reason for this he said because ye trespassed against me among the children of israel at the water of mary bakadesh in the wilderness of zin so because flesh moses allowed flesh because moses allowed flesh he did not sanctify the lord in the midst of the children of israel he said because ye sanctified me not in the midst of the children of israel therefore you cannot enter the promised land so flesh will not enter into the fullness of the dimensions of salvation flesh will always be judged i told us most times the reason things seem to want to go wrong in our lives is not because anything is wrong it's not because the devil is doing anything it is god allowing flesh to be judged it is god dealing with flesh so some of the the systems we build our life around is not one that will allow us enter into the fullness of the blessings of god so god will allow it to be destroyed sometimes our lifestyle everything we do motivated by flesh god will break it the reason most times we don't enter into the visions we see in the spirit is because flesh is in the way god will show you the visions god will show you you are a prophet he will show you you are an apostle he will show you you are a governor he will show you but for you to enter there and be a kingdom agent flesh must die this is why God himself took Moses to the mountain and showed him the promised land. But he said, you will die on this mountain. That place where you had that encounter is the place where flesh must be judged. If flesh is not judged, that vision will never be realized. This is why Moses never made it to the, 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 the promised land. You will see it, but you will not enter unless flesh is first of all destroyed. And then we looked at how God judged Aaron. Aaron is symbolic of our priesthood. Aaron is the high priest. But God would not let Aaron enter into the promised land. In Numbers chapter 20, verse 23 to 29, God would make a public spectacle of the judgments of Aaron. And he said unto Moses and Aaron in Mount Hall, by the coast of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered into his people, for he shall not enter into the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. It's so amazing that God would tell you you will die. You know, Paul would say, you dearly beloved, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. God will not deal with flesh while you are sleeping. He will tell you he's dealing with your flesh. You will be awake, you will look at it, you will know. And God will yet be dealing with flesh. Say unto Aaron, he shall be gathered unto his fathers. Why? He said, because you rebelled against my word at the waters of Meribah. So flesh manifested itself again. And he said, take Aaron and Eleazar his son, bring them up to the Mount Hall, and strip Aaron of his garment, and put them upon Eleazar his son, and Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, and shall die there. So God has zero level tolerance for flesh, because if flesh is in the way, the eternal purpose of God will never be fulfilled. Aaron shall be gathered unto his fathers. Aaron shall be destroyed. Aaron shall die, because Aaron was symbolic of flesh so long as because aaron's rebellion rather was symbolic of flesh so long as aaron rebelled against the word of the lord his priesthood his ranking his stature is of no significance he cannot make it to where god wants him to go to then we saw miriam who is the prophetess of god in numbers chapter 12 verse 1 to 16 rebelling against the authorities of god and god will descend in a white in a cloud and judge miriam striking her with leprosy and the moment Miriam was struck with leprosy, God, Moses would intercede for Miriam. And God would say unto Moses, If a child sins against the father, will the father not spit on her face? Miriam will be left outside of the camp for seven days, and God would enact that judgment upon that fleshly manifestation. We also saw Korah, Natan, and Abiram in Numbers 16, verse 1 to 40. Who rebelled against the Lord. Korah, Nathan, and Abiram were Levites, and they were also symbolic of the gifted amongst the children of God. Because their argument was that they also hear the Lord. Is it only Moses and Aaron that God speaks to? Do we not hear the Lord? Really? Flesh in manifestation. We saw the 12 spices that were sent in Numbers 13 and 14 who returned 
only Joshua and Caleb were approved. The rest will be destroyed in the wilderness. Why? Because they were of the flesh. They were of the flesh. The Bible called them men of an evil heart. But Joshua and Caleb, the Lord said they were of a different spirit. These are men of the spirit. So God will never tolerate flesh. Israel as a camp again and again was joined. In Numbers 16, 41 to 50, the Bible would reveal to us how that Israel rebelled against Moses and the Lord because of the judgment that came upon Korah and his team. And God will descend with anger. And God will strike. And Moses would tell Aaron to go and, 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 and intercede for Israel, you know, with the golden censer in the midst of the people. Even at that, 14,000 people were slain. So, God has zero level tolerance for flesh. There is no room for flesh in the economy of the divine. This is why most times our journey with God is delayed. Most times, there are most of us that see visions. We know what we should be in God. At the tender age of 10, at the tender age of 12, at the tender age of 15, yet we never become what we see. The reason is because the distance between the vision and the manifestation is the judgment of flesh. The degree to which you allow your flesh to be judged is, the, is, the, 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 is what determines the speed and the rapidity of your manifestation. And even while you are in your manifestation, the extent to which flesh dies is the extent to which you will see God through, manifest through your life. Because flesh is the impediment to the glory. He said, no flesh shall glory in the presence of the Lord. The question now is, what is flesh? Flesh is simply the fallen nature. Flesh is the nature, other than God's nature, that we took upon the fall. Remember, he said in Genesis 1.26, Let us make man in our own image, after our likeness. Number two, he said man should have fellowship with him. And we saw that in Genesis 3 verse 8. So, the man was made in the image of God. That means the essence of man is the essence of God. You remember in Genesis 2.7, he said he formed man out of the ground, and he breathed the breath of his into his nostrils, and man became a living soul. So, so man carried the essence of God. The word create in Genesis 1.26, like we saw in the last class, is the word bara. And the word bara simply means to create, to make out of nothing. So the man came from the substance of God. The intangible dimension of God is what God encased in flesh and called man. So the man had the nature of God. Now, for the man to function like God, he had to be in fellowship continually. Because the principle of expression, the principle of expression is the image principle we all with unveiled faces beholding as in the glass the image of the lord we are changed so the man always had fellowship with god that's why god came walking the voice of god came walking in the garden in the cool of the day so that the man could behold god and reflect the same and this protocol the man followed tenaciously because you see in genesis 2 19 the bible said the name the man called the animal that is the name that was because the man could look into the charter of heaven and he knows what God intends. The reason is because he was in fellowship. So, because the man had the image of God, the essence of God, and was in constant fellowship with God, he could reflect God. That reflection of God is what is called dominion. He brought his system under the government and the governance of the Holy Spirit. Flesh is therefore the, the nature that is other than God's nature that takes a man takes man away from God's presence and causes man to lose the ability to bring creation under the government of God. Flesh is the nature other than God's nature that takes man away from God's presence and causes man to lose the ability to bring creation under the dominion of God. That nature is primarily the serpentine nature. That is why in Mark, in John, John chapter 8 verse 44, it says, You have your father, the devil, and the works of your father shall ye do. The lust of your father shall ye do. So the man took the nature of the devil. So he became an offspring of the devil. And the man began to function by lust, which drove him from God's presence. Because he said, Love not the world. They that love the world, the love of the father is not in them. So when you function by lust, the love of the Father is no longer you. So you are driven from the presence of God. You are taken away 
from the presence of God. He said, what is in the world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. So man took the nature, the image of the serpent. He now was driven from the presence of God because they started functioning by the economy of lust. And then he lost the ability of bringing creation under the government of God. So he said in Romans 8, 19, that creation, the earnest expectation of creation, waited for the manifestation of the sons, the offsprings, the carriers of the nature of God, who looks upon him every day and draws of his strength to dominate the world and bring the world back to its state of freedom. Flesh is that nature of the serpent, that nature that is not God's nature, that drives man from the presence and gives and, and takes the ability, the inherent ability in man to bring creation under the government and the governance of God. How does flesh manifest? It manifests through inspirations, motivations, and abilities other than God. So you can as well say flesh is a life form that produces inspirations, motivations, and empowerment sourced from an origin apart from God. Creation, flesh can also be said to be a life form that produces inspirations, motivations, and empowerment other than God, or sourced from origins other than God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, you will see that God will come to judge the motivations in the heart of man. That means God will never approve of it. Every motivation that is not of God is flesh, and God will judge it. In 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5, God judged the intentions in the heart of God. He said, therefore, judge nothing before its time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, and then shall every man receive the praise of of God. So God will only praise the man if all his actions are motivated from him. So every action not motivated from God is flesh. Secondly, in Romans chapter 8 verse 11, we see how that God will judge every form of inspiration, every form of operation, every form of quickening that is not of himself. He said, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in your mortal body, he shall quicken your mortal bodies by that spirit that dwells in you. So every quickening of God is supposed to be sponsored by the spirit of God. So every inspiration that the Holy Ghost does not vet and endorse is not of God, it's flesh. And then finally, God will judge every empowerment that is not of him because it's flesh. In Hebrews chapter 12 verse 28, he said, having received a kingdom that cannot be moved, let us receive grace whereby we serve God acceptably with fear and reverence for our God is a consuming fire. So every empowerment that is not of God will be judged. Therefore, flesh manifolds, manifests in threefold, inspirations, motivations, and empowerment that is not of God. How do you identify flesh? You identify flesh by its works, by its manifestations. If you receive inspirations, motivations, and empowerment that is not of the Spirit of God, there are manifestations that are signatures to that fact that those inspirations, motivations, and empowerment are not of God. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21, Paul would take time to outline all most of the manifestations that are endorsements to the fact that our inspirations, motivations, and empowerment are not of God. He said, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envying, murder, drunkenness, reveling, and such, such likes. That means everything that is in this category. What category? Manifestations, sponsored, and power. Therefore, whoever is joined with Christ is one spirit with him. That's a consciousness. 
So, if you walk with that consciousness, I am one with the Holy Spirit. I am joined with the Holy Spirit. I am one with the Spirit of the Living God. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Something happens. Your spirit man begins to glow. And that light of God begins to eat off flesh from within you. It's, it's the cure, but many don't know. In Romans chapter 6 verse 1, he said, Shall we then continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, God forbid. He said, Do you not know that you are dead in Christ? That whoever is buried with Christ in baptism, the same is dead to sin. So the first way to deal with, with flesh is a consciousness of the presence of God. And that consciousness eats of flesh. And the way to do it is to walk with that knowing of everything Jesus has done for you. And then in Romans 6 verse 11, he say, Recon, recon, recon. That means calculate it, account it unto yourself. That you are dead so i wake up in the morning the devil brings a thought of fornication i say i am dead to fornication the devil brings a a, a wicked thought against a brother i say i am dead to strive i am dead to variance i tell it to myself and then something begins to happen i begin to change because i am building a consciousness i am building a consciousness many don't carry the consciousness of god we carry the consciousness of sin. We carry the consciousness of death. Because while growing up, all we saw was, was sin and death. All we saw was hatred, fight, variance. So it inundated our consciousness. The first way to deal with flesh is to carry the presence of God. And you carry the presence of God first by building a consciousness. The second way you carry the presence of God is by beholding the Lord. Remember, the consciousness of the presence of God causes the spirit of his mouth to destroy flesh according to second thessalonians chapter 2 verse 8 when we behold god we see his face we see his face in second corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 he said we all with unveiled faces beholding as in a glass the image of the lord we are changed we all with unveiled faces beholding as in a glass the image of the lord we are changed remember from every scripture we are reading it is the Holy Ghost that works the transformation. But there are protocols that allows for the Holy Ghost to work this transformation. Because you may want to struggle, you will fail. Israel attempted it for 1,500 years. But if the Holy Ghost begins to work, then it begins to mortify the deeds of the flesh. Now, the first way to allow the Holy Ghost to work is when you carry the consciousness of who you are in God. Because he said that the spirit of his mouth shall consume the wicked one. Why we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen, they are temporal. The things which are unseen, they are eternal. What are the things which are unseen? The written word of God. Because the walls were framed by the word of God. And the things which are, were not made out of the things which do appear. So the word of God are those unseen, intangible reality. So when we begin to talk the word of God to ourselves, what we are doing is that we are beholding the word. And then as we do that over and over, the word is now stored in our spirit. The word is now incubating in our spirit. And something begins to happen. As we close our eyes, we begin to see the picture of the word of God. That's what contemplation is. Contemplation simply means visualizing the word of God. And then once in a while, the snapshots come to you. And then you see yourself. You see yourself in different dimensions. The word of God becomes portals. They become gateways into dimensions in God. So at first you began. You say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. It looks like a joke. But you kept talking it to yourself. You kept talking it to yourself. A point comes, you now begin to visualize. So suddenly you see yourself as the righteousness of God. It downs. That awareness comes. That is when light is shed. Because the Holy Ghost cannot reveal it to you unless you engage that word. This is what begins to happen. And in 1 John chapter 3 verse 2, it says, When we see him, we shall be like him. So how do you deal with flesh? You deal with flesh by beholding the Lord. And beholding the Lord is a function of meditation and contemplation. How often do you talk the word to yourself? How often do you visualize the word of God? That is what will take you from masturbation. A lot of people call us here and there that they're struggling with masturbation. They're struggling with immorality. They don't want to take responsibility. Yes, there is a spirit that makes for enslaved people in masturbation and immorality. But the cure is not just deliverance. 
because when an evil spirit is gone out of a man matthew chapter 12 verse 44 he goes about in dry places seeking where he may dwell finding none it returns to where it was cast from and if he will find the place clean kept and garnished it will return with seven more wicked demons and jesus said worse will be the state of that man than the beginning thereof you see that so if we just deliver people and the word of god is not incubated in their spirit the demon will come and they will become worse and they will not know why their case is deteriorating the cure is to get the word into your spirit he said my son proverbs 4 20 attend to my word give thine ears to my sin let them not depart from thy eyes put them in the midst of thy heart for they are alive to them that find it and held to all their flesh so you want to see the power of the holy ghost for taming the flesh you have to behold the lord and the way to behold the lord is by meditating and contemplating the word he said until i come first timothy 4 13 and 15 give attendance to reading to exhortation and to doctrine give thyself wholly to these things and thy profiting will be made manifest to all you want to break out from that power of addiction you want to break out to that from that flesh that holds you in slave this is the cure this is what every one of us do and we keep moving from glory to glory we interact with the world we eat the world jeremiah 15 16 he said i did found thy word and i ate it and it became the joy and rejoicing of my heart in psalm 119 verse 9 and 11 how shall a young man keep his ways by taking heed unto thy word thy word have i put in my heart that i may not sin against you if that word is not in your heart you can never see the lord you behold him the second way to behold the lord is by waiting upon the lord God is a king spirit. So you must learn the art of waiting upon him. And so in that quiet moment of the spirit, the Lord will come passing. The Lord will come intermingling with you. And then something happens. He begins to re-engineer you from within. This is one of the greatest cure in scriptures. He said in Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 40 verse, no, Isaiah 40 verse 28 to 31. He said, have you not heard? Has it not been said to you that the everlasting God fainted not, neither is he weary? He said, He giveth power to the faint, and unto them that have no strength, no might, he increases strength. He said, Even the youth shall faint, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord, they shall mount up with wings like the eagles. They shall run, they shall not be weary. They shall walk, they shall not faint. What has happened? In verse 28, it reveals to us the strength, the undepletable strength of God. In verse 29 he reveals to us the weakness the vulnerability of man and then in verse 31 he reveals to us all of a sudden the man becomes like god what happened the key is in verse 30 waiting upon the lord when you wait upon the lord you bridge your yourself with god and your weaknesses are swallowed up and is replaced with the strength of god the question is how do we wait on god what does it mean to wait on god waiting on the lord is not just to sit quiet waiting on the lord is an economy of the soul where the soul is quietened and the soul is focused on the lord jesus christ and there are not too many ways this can be achieved in christ the soul is quietened and the soul becomes focused on on the lord on, on the lord jesus christ how do you do this there are three ways of doing it one is by prayer two is by meditation three is by worship four is by chanting the hymns the psalms and the melodies of god these are four major ways of waiting upon the lord now the prayer the worship the chanting and the meditation themselves are not waiting but they bring you to that place where your soul becomes quiet and then you begin to wait on the lord waiting on the lord simply means gazing upon the lord because every distraction every noise has been removed from your soul now how does prayer do that when you pray through something happens your soul becomes gathered unto the lord in philippians chapter 4 verse 6 and 7 he said be anxious for nothing anxiety is a noise in the soul but by all things in prayer and supplication let your request be made known unto god and the peace of god that surpasses knowledge shall garrison your heart so the way to quieten the soul is by praying through i'm not talking about thank you jesus few prayers and then you go away i'm not talking about praying with time that's not what i'm talking about I'm talking about praying through. I'm talking about breaking forth in prayer. You tarry in the presence until that house rent, that lust, that anger, that sentiment, that malice, everything falls off because you have in the spirit ascended to sit with Christ in heavenly places. Something has happened. You have ascended. So it's taken out. 
and every the only thing that is in your soul now is the Lord. That point you begin to wait. So how do you attain waiting by prayer? You pray through, and when your soul becomes quiet, don't end your prayer. That's when you stay, and as you stay, a lot of things begin to happen. Sometimes you find yourself weeping. Sometimes you find yourself seeing series of visions upon vision. You are lost in God. Sometimes you find yourself groaning. And in Romans chapter 8 verse 26, he said, The Spirit himself helpeth our infirmities. He helpeth our infirmities. How does he do it? By groanings that cannot be altered. All of this economy are economies that work in the waiting place. But you must pray through to get there. You want to see the groanings of the Spirit. You want to see the visions of the Spirit. You want to see the, the overwhelming presence of God. It's when you wait upon the Lord. So waiting upon the Lord is to climb the mountains of God. In the Old Testament, we'll see how that Moses will climb Mount Sinai, which is over 6,700 feet tall. And he will be there sometimes for six days before the Lord descends. When God comes down, the man who went up is not the man who comes down. As he returns from that mountain, the Bible said his face was shining like the sun. He said he wished not. He wished not. Flesh is being swallowed up. He wished not that his face shone like the sun. So waiting upon the Lord is one of the potent economies of dealing with flesh. But you can wait upon the Lord when you pray through. In Matthew chapter 17 verse 2, he said Jesus took Peter, James and John to the mountain and as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. He was transfigured before them. So waiting re-engineers your soul structure. The presence of God eats up flesh. Waiting on God re-engineers your soul structure. The second way to wait upon the Lord is worship. As you worship God, you discover that something happens. You come into the gate of God. He said, let us enter into his courts with praise. So it brings you into the presence. And then the protocol of transformation begins. The third way is by, by speaking to yourself in psalms, in hymns, and in spiritual song, And then chanting, making melody in your heart to the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18, he said, Be not drunk with wine, daring its excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourself in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs, making melody in your heart unto the Lord. So you see that the way you come to the quarters of waiting is either when you pray through or when you are saturated in the place of melodies, hymns, talking it to yourself, or when you are choked with the Word of God. So let the Word of God dwell in you richly. And that you do by meditation and contemplation or when you've prayed through. This is another way of dealing with flesh. The reason that masturbation will be for 10 years is because you have not waited on the Lord. The reason that masturbation will be there for 5 years is because you have not tarried in God's presence. So, the second way to deal with flesh is by beholding His face. And the third way to deal with flesh is by turning to the Lord. And most times God does this by, with circumstances. He say, I, John, your fellow prisoner and brother in Christ, for the testimony of the Lord, I was in the Isle of Patmos on the last day, and I heard a sound. And as I turned, I heard the sound as of a trumpet. And as I turned, that is what it means. God allows circumstances to buffet you until you come to a point where you are absolutely dependent on Him. And suddenly you begin to hear the sounds of heaven. He said in Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3, He said, And He humbled thee in the wilderness, and suffered you to hunger, that you may know that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. How do you get this knowledge that you may know when he humbles you and suffers you to hunger? What it means is he allowed you to hunger so that you will know that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. That is when your trust, your gaze, your focus is turned to the Lord. So most times God deals with flesh through trials and tribulation. In James chapter 1 verse 3, he said, The trials of our faith walketh unto us patience. And he said, That trial is more precious than gold that goes through fire. Flesh is dealt with when God allows you to go through the fires of life, the circumstances of life. What it does is that that fire will purge you. He said in, in Malachi chapter 3 verse 2, that he shall appear in his course and he shall thoroughly pour the sons of Levi that they may bring an acceptable service unto the Lord. How does God do it? He allows you to go through fire. He allows you to go through the water. The thing is that he is telling you that you will not be burned. You will not be drowned. So what happens is that you come out and you yield on God. Because if you don't go through trials, most of the times you will trust in the arm of flesh. And they say, woe unto the man 
that trusted in flesh woe unto the man that maketh arm his strength he said he would dwell in the patch places of the wilderness in a soft land not habited but blessed in the man is the man whose trust is the lord my trust is the lord not because i mentally assented it no i came to a point where i was broken i was broken and suddenly i become a man that is perpetually pleasing unto the lord in psalm 51 verse 17 he said the sacrifices of a contrite heart and a broken spirit the lord cannot despise this is what God does when he wants to deal with flesh. He allows you to go through the wilderness of life. This is why he carried Israel through the wilderness. And they were purged. They were circumcised. They were, they were broken. And the generation that entered the promised land is a broken gener generation. A generation circumcised for the work of the kingdom. Paul, the famous grace and faith preacher, one of the greatest ambassadors of this kingdom, he said he learned trust when he went through despair in second corinthians chapter 8 verse 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 second corinthians chapter 1 verse 7 paul would say something very very strategic second corinthians 1 verse 7 he said and our hope of you steadfast knowing that as ye are partakers of his suffering ye shall also be partakers of the consolation i know a lot of people who say no, 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 we don't have to suffer. There are many things in your life that will not break until you go through certain circumstances. He said, for we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble. This is why he said you should be partaker of the suffering, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, in so much that we despaired even of life. And Paul would say something. But we had the sentence of death on ourselves that we should not so the sentence of death was his teacher that we should not trust in ourselves but in God that raises the dead. So trials, pains and peri taught Paul how to rely on God. And Paul would come back gloriously in Philippians chapter 3 verse 3. We are the circumcision that worship God in the spirit, rejoicing in Christ Jesus, having no confidence in the flesh. Some of the tribulations you run away from, discerning, discerning them now, I'm not talking about the attacks of the devil. I'm not talking about plagues and pestilences. I'm talking about some of the circumstances that come to your life that you know is dealing with something in your life. They are schools of the spirit. They are the taskmasters that breaks the flesh. What these things do for you is that they make you to rely on God. A funny thing happened to me some years ago. I had need for a small amount of money. And then I quickly, in my usual way, began to call my friends called all my friends and none of them would give me this little money I was looking for and suddenly I heard the voice in my spirit woe unto the man that trusted in flesh woe unto the man that maketh flesh his arm it shall be in the part places of the wilderness a salt land not inhabited and suddenly I repented suddenly I cried out to Lord I believe and it was not up to 10 minutes another friend that never came to mind sent me an alert that was three times the money I was looking for without me asking him because God, as God was working in me, he was working in him. But that would only happen when I can trust because my faith is the activator of the power of the Holy Spirit. Most times, we anchor our life on the things of this world and we can never enter into the deep places of God. Ask yourself the question, how much of God's purpose can you sponsor with all what you can get by your own strength? I tell you, you will do so little. That was what killed the desire and the pursuit of jobs for me. God told me, if I give you a job that you earn a million naira every month, how much will you earn in a lifetime? I realized in a year I would have 12 million, even if I wasn't spending from it. And for 35 years of service, I will have about 400 million. And God said, the purpose and the destiny I've given to you, can you fulfill it with 400 million? I realized how vain man was. And I said, Lord, have your way in my life. Now, this is not to say it is wrong to work. This is not to say it is wrong to pick up a secular job. No, this is saying accepting the verdict of your ordination sometimes is a function of death to flesh. And God will do this by allowing you to go through circumstances that will cause you to turn to the Lord. Like Paul, who was taught trust by the verdict of death. So are most of us going to be torn from the powers of flesh. Because I mentioned the secular job, let me add this before I round up. Secular job is not evil. Secular job is not flesh. A secular job is a platform that allows either flesh or spirit find expression. 
problems that you bring under the government and the governance of the Holy Spirit. This morning, my prayer for you is that as you receive this word, you will put them to practice because the power is in the practice. Remember, the agent of transformation is the Holy Spirit. But it's as you stay in the presence that the, the Holy Spirit eats of flesh. It's as you behold the Lord that the Holy Ghost deals with flesh. And it's as you turn to the Lord because of the circumstances that serves as an alarm that the Holy Ghost is activated. So, as you continually engage the Holy, the Holy Ghost, because this is a walk, that is when flesh will die. I pray for you today that as you receive this word, you will put them to practice. You will not be a hearer only, but you will be a doer of this word. And at the end, your life will become an endless fountain of God's glory and presence. Father, I pray for your people. I ask that your mighty hand will come upon them, quicken in them a hunger and an appetite for your presence. Give them the wisdom and the capacity to constantly behold your face. And Lord, even as they go through the circumstances of life, cause them to turn to you so that your plenteous redemption can reach out to them and the powers of flesh will be destroyed so that in the end, we will know you experientially. We will hunger for your presence and live a life of absolute intimacy and fellowship and will become agents of transformation and dominion in our world. Thank you, Father. Take all the glory, for we know it is done in Jesus' precious name. Until our next class, thank you for having me. I remain Apostle Michael Oropo, and this is the School of Doctrine.